Let's see, this is where you are. I don't have Hello. Good afternoon, guys. Guys, it's a full house. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to see so many familiar faces and such a good turnout. We talked about kind of topics that would be good. And I think that it, one of the important ones and one that I get a lot of questions about are non-motor symptoms. So we all know the motor symptoms or what, you know, the, the typical symptoms of Parkinson's, right? The uh, tremor for some, um, the slowness, stiffness, balance issues, right? So those are the typical ones that we all know about. And, um, but we don't often talk about what we call the non-motor symptoms. So the ones that you don't necessarily see. Um, but I think it's important to talk about because they're, they can be actually more bothersome than, than the motor symptoms. Um, and you know, this is a treatment that affects quality of life and it's these symptoms that can impact more so. so and, and a lot of times they're vague and they can be attributed to other things um, and so they get missed or in, in talking with your physician, you know, it doesn't seem as important or we don't ask about it, quite frankly, um, because we're trying to, did this get cut off? Can you hear me all right? Um, to work with, no, did it stop? Okay. Okay. Better? Okay. <laughs> so, like I said, so maybe we don't ask about it because we're focused on the walking and the tremor and all that, but we don't tend to ask. Um, but that's why I think they're, they're important and, and because they can be treated successfully and managed. And, and the goal to a lot of these two is staying on top of it um, and, and addressing it before it becomes a major issue. Um, so we really divide them up into three category so we talk about autonomic dysfunction so our body the things our bodies do automatically and then um, and then those are the ones that can come out of whack so that's blood pressure issues body temperature regulation those things that the things that we take for granted that our bodies do automatically for us those can get kind of out of whack um, the other is cognitive and psychiatric issues so mood um, dementia all those type of related issues um, and then sleep disorders so things that affect our sleep, and when our sleep is impacted, then we have a, you know, it starts to bleed into our day, and, and how we function. So to begin with, with the autonomic dysfunction, about 10 percent, and I and I suspect it's probably more. So these averages aren't coming from from my clinic, but just from uh, statistics uh, that are out there. But 10 percent of patients have issues with drooling, or what we call salaria. Um, usually, it starts in the nighttime. We all drool at night, well, let's just be honest, right? Um, but what you might notice is it's, it's an increase or you're soaking the pillow. Um, then as, and that's mild in the beginning and sometimes with advanced uh, Parkinson's or as symptoms advance, then you might have some during the day as well. What you notice is a lot of times it happens um, during meal times as well because our bodies automatically increase a little bit the production of saliva during meal times around that time. So you're naturally going to be able to notice it more. Now, it's not an increase in saliva that, that's the issue. It's that the efficiency of the swallowing becomes impaired. So that, that um, coordination of swallowing. So you're not swallowing as efficiently as you did, and so then the saliva builds up. And then also facial expression, you're not moving your lips, you're not moving your face as much as you did before, and then what happens is that combination causes the drooling. But it can be addressed. So sometimes it's just a tweak in medication, or patients who come in as, you know, not treated, and all of a sudden we made that diagnosis, we start them on the sentiment, and we realize that, okay, the drooling's improved. So sometimes it's a tweak in medication. If it's more than that and it's becoming bothersome, then um, the other option is atropine drops, so they're eye drops. Um, but you can use them in, in water. Uh, if you drop some water, you swish it around your mouth, you spit it out, it dries the mouth temporarily, and you can use that several times a day. I usually tell patients you use it before meals, you use it before bedtime, whenever it is that's bothering you, and that tends to help. Um, and then if it, you're know, chewing gum, uh, sucking on hard candy, those things help because they're initiating, they're causing you to swallow more. So it's just a natural reflex that if you're going to chew gum, you're going to swallow more often. So it, it kind of stimulates you to do that. Um, and then if it becomes a more 
pressing issue and it's not being controlled, then botulinum toxin. More, probably you guys know it more as Botox, which is a brand, um, but there's several of those toxins now. So the, the botulinum toxin injections, it's four injections, it's covered by insurance, it's just very superficial little there, 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 and it dries it up for about three months. So it decreases the production of it. Um, it doesn't necessarily leave you with a dry mouth, um, but it, it can decrease the production, which makes it a little bit more tolerable, especially for longer periods of time. So that's, that's the, how we treat that. Now, the other issue that comes up sometimes, and I don't think we talk about that a lot either, is the runny nose. Yeah, does anybody have issues with runny nose? Um, so the atropine drops can be used in a Q-tip. Same thing, you just swab it around in the, in the nose and it will help dry that up as well. Um, so that's another way to deal with that. And then when we go on from the drooling is swallowing issues. So with swallowing issues, of course, the biggest fear is, is to choke, correct? Now, it doesn't mean that everybody is going to have swallowing issues or that everyone is going to start choking right away. That's not it. The, the key to this is prevention. And that's why I always have, I insist with the speech therapy or speech eval, all those things, because a lot of it can be prevented, simple things like, you know, positioning your head when you swallow, good posture, slowing down when you're eating, not trying to eat and talk and do everything at the same time, um, you know, taking a sip of water before you eat and avoiding the, the hard, dry foods. Cornbread is a good one that I hear about a lot. Um, also the problem with um, pills, especially larger pills or capsules that tend to stick. So applesauce, pudding, you can take that with a spoonful of that and it coats it and it helps it slide down. And so those are, those are little tips that help with that. But again, the key to that is really staying on top of it. So early, early on, you know, you might have some difficulty with pills or with certain foods and you can avoid it and make adjustments to, to, to handle all that. But if um, you start to have issues with someone not addressing it, the risks are aspiration and pneumonia. And you don't want an aspiration pneumonia. It's different than a viral um, and they're bad pneumonias right? and, and hard to treat. Um, that's just food or liquid that gets in your lungs from what you're eating or drinking. Um, or even the saliva that gets in there. Um, which brings me quick before I forget, another point is your oral health brushing your teeth good, making sure that your teeth are healthy. Because if you aspirate, and you're aspirating a mouthful of you know, bacteria from a tooth that's gone bad or, or decay in there, that's even a worse type of pneumonia to get. So that's something we don't talk about. I think it's important. Um, but if you have trouble swallowing, what that can lead to, if we don't address it in time and we let it go too far, is malnutrition. Because you're not eating enough because it's taking you so long to eat, you're having trouble swallowing, you're scared to, to choke, so you're decreasing your portions, you're not getting the calories in that you need. Um, choking, and then also the, as we talked about, the aspiration. Um, but all these things can be addressed, right? um, and, and we can address them with, with preventive measures as well. Um, while we're talking about the swallowing, the choking is voice too the hypophonia, where your voice gets softer as the day goes on, or the more that you talk, or, or volume changes, or hoarseness, that can be addressed with speech therapy too. Now, I don't have a pill that's gonna fix that. So that is therapy and doing the work with the therapist, um, but it does work. And you, know, and, and you can, we, we record it, we check decibels, we look at all that, and there is a difference. But if you don't address it, it will get worse and worse and worse. And it, just like with anything else, it's better to deal with it early on than to wait too long, and then you're gonna have to work a lot harder. The other part with taste, uh, with swallowing and all that is smell and taste. So one of the very early symptoms, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so one of the things early on in, in the symptoms is um, your sense of smell. You, you, find that very early on, and some people may not notice it, but they may notice that there's a change in the way food tastes. Um, and that's just, it's connected. So if you're not smelling things well, you're not tasting things well. And that can decrease your appetite. And there's not a big danger in that, it's just that it's annoying. Um, and it does affect sometimes appetite and therefore weight. 
Um, but it is one of these earlier symptoms that we talk about that sometimes precedes the motor symptoms, sometimes up to 10 years or more. Um, and it's, they're subtle. It's subtle. And then some patients have told me that once they, they start a medication or we increase a dose, suddenly they may have a few days where their smell comes back. And sometimes it's bothersome <laughs> right? because they're not used to it. It's, it's almost an overload of stimulus from the smells that they weren't used to having before. Um, so then on to the um, autonomic stuff as far as body temperature. So being able to control your body temperature. So when it's cold, you might notice it more. Your tremor may be more pronounced. Um, that regulation that we take for granted is not as quick. The response isn't as fast. Uh, so one of those things is excessive sweating. Um, some that you might not ask about, you think, oh, you're just hot, or if it's females, you know, it's menopause, or it's, you know, no, it can be the Parkinson's. And what we're talking about excessive, so we're talking sometimes drenching, where you're soaked, um, and it comes and goes. A lot of times it can be linked to your dosing, so as you wear off, right, so as the medication starts to wear off in your system and your motor symptoms start to come back or become more noticeable, a lot of times you can get those sweat, that sweating in there. And you know, there's ways to, to help with that. A lot of times it's just regulation of medication, not letting you wear off, which is the key to a lot of these symptoms, is not letting it wear off. Um, but a lot of times it can, it can just present face, um, feet, hands, but it, you know, that's an annoying thing. So it's one of those things we, we don't ask about often, but if it's happening, let us know. Um, it also can happen when you have issues with medication. Um, so if it's too much or too little, it all depends on what you're telling us. But a lot of times, the majority of the times, it's from off time, off periods, or the medication wearing off. Constipation, just a big one. I think about 75% of patients with Parkinson's have issues with constipation. So what is, you, I guess all the time, how often should I be going to the bathroom? And everybody's different. So, and it doesn't mean you have to go to the bathroom every day. Um, there are some people who go multiple times a day and that's their normal. But usually I say, well, if you are going more than, if you're going more than three days without having a bowel movement, then, that, then that's a problem. Or if you're straining to have to go every time you're going to the bathroom, then that's a problem. This is one of those things too that you, we can deal with it. There are medications out there other than conservative measures, we got conservative measures, things that you can do at home or over the counter um, to help. Some of the basic stuff is increase your hydration, increase your fluid intake, right? It just keeps everything moving. Um, you can use over the counter medications like Colace. Miralax is one that I like a lot because it's gentle, it doesn't cause habit, um, and it can be adjusted. To what you need, but it only works the day you take it, so you've got to take it every day. Um, increasing your fiber intake, all those things that, that we all probably know about. Um, but the problem is that if you wait till you're already constipated and then you fix that problem, now you're going again, but then you don't do anything about it until you're constipated again. And you know, then you're, you're pedaling backwards. So you've got to stay on top of it, not let yourself get constipated. Um, the reason I harp on it is because you can't absorb your medication if you're constipated. You know, and, and so that's the important part. So if everything's just sitting there not moving, the sentiment and the other medications are being absorbed through your gut. So you're not going to get the full effect of the medication. Same is true if things are moving too quickly through your intestine, then you're not absorbing what you should absorb. So that's the important how of why it affects you motor wise. Uh, one of the interesting things that, that came up here in the last, we had our yearly conference on movement disorders this summer um, in June, and what they're looking at now is that irritable bowel syndrome is now a new risk factor for Parkinson's disease. So irritable bowel syndrome, so is the um, you know, fluctuation between constipation and gas and diarrhea, and you know, so they're now looking at that as, as a risk factor for Parkinson's disease. Um, doesn't mean that everybody will develop it. Um, but as we've all known for quite some time that most patients with Parkinson's have GI issues. And for years now, they've looked at it as one of the things to study to see if we can use it um, for 
diagnosis or for diagnosing ahead of time and all these. And there is something to that. There's just lack of funding <laughs> in research. But there are a few, um, a few places now that are getting back into it. So I'd say about 10 years ago or so, yeah, less than that, they were doing some extensive research into that. Um, and then they had to pause because of funding. And now they're kind of getting back into that. Um, so it's not uncommon to have issues with, with the GI system. And it doesn't always mean constipation. Like I said, sometimes it's loose stools or, or gas or a lot of other issues. But what I would say, too, is that to keep in mind, just because you have Parkinson's doesn't mean you can't have other issues. Right, so a lot of times if we can't get control of a GI issue, then there is a place for a gastroenterologist to, to make sure that everything else is okay or endoscopy or testing to make sure everything else is okay. Um, bladder, bladder issues. So most common are urinary urgency, frequency, um, nocturia, which is a lot of going to the bathroom at night, right? So I have some patients that have to go four or five times at night or more, and that really just starts to disrupt sleep. Uh, so Parkinson's can cause a lot of that, so can prostates. <laughs> so like I said, you gotta make sure that we're looking at it from a lot of different angles and we're not just blaming everything on the Parkinson's, because I get that a lot. So always make sure there's not something else going on. Um, but that's just, you know, you can have that. A lot of times the, the medication can improve the urgency or the frequency with Parkinson's and just being on the right dose of medication can help. But if not, then, um, and we've ruled out any other issues, then there are things we can do to help, especially at night. Um, but as some of the things that you guys can do on your own is avoiding caffeine, limiting how much fluid you, you take in after dinner so that you're not getting up to go to the bathroom all night long um, and then also make sure like I said that for males that prostate is checked and that your primary care is staying on top of that the other thing that we don't talk a lot about that's under autonomic dysfunction is sexual dysfunction and I get some questions but not a lot um, and I don't think it's something we talk about but there is sexual dysfunction in Parkinson's um, Additionally, we talk about um, difficulty reaching orgasm, decreased libido, um, it's erectile dysfunction. There's a lot of things that can play into that, diabetes, a lot of other things, but Parkinson's can also contribute to that. Um, as far as mood as well, um, and sometimes the opposite end of decreased libido is hypersexuality, which really is a side effect of medication, oftentimes the, the dopamine agonists. So the Requip, Repenerol, Meripex, the Primapex, all those medications um, is one of the things we, we should be asking about too. Um, something that is out of the ordinary for you it can be a side effect of the medication. Um, these side, stopping the medication fixes that and a lot of the sexual dysfunction, if it's not mood related, can, can respond to medications all those medications that you see on TV, right? The Levitra and all that, <laughs> it does help. And so does mood st stabilizers, so antidepressants and things like that. So there are some things to try. But, um, but don't be shy to ask about it and talk about it because it's just, it's part of our lives and it is affected by the Parkinson's. The other thing is autonomic. There's a lot of autonomic <laughs> dysfunction, right? Um, orthostatic hypotension or the drops in blood pressure. This is pretty common, um, and as disease progresses, in most patients of mine, this is 30 to 58 percent of patients have issue with blood pressure. Initially, what you start to see is labile blood pressure, so it's high, it's low, it's all over the place. Um, but eventually, it starts to level out, and it's low. Uh, and a lot of times, most of my patients can come off of their blood pressure medication just because it's one of the issues. If you start feeling like you're lightheaded, it's different than a dizziness, not a spinning sensation, but a lightheadedness, like you feel like you want to pass out, vision, you know, it can affect your vision, um, peripheral vision, you start to black out. Um, I think it's probably, right, it's happened to all of us. If we bend over for too long, stand up too quick, and you feel that for a few seconds, and it passes. It's, you know, automatically what our body does when we stand up, it's gravity. When we stand up, gravity pulls, and it pulls the blood down. And our automatic response in our body is for our vessels to constrict 
and push that blood right back up to our heads where it needs to be so that we don't get dizzy and we're not lightheaded. And all that is, is is a sign that there's not enough blood flow in the brain. Your natural body's response is you lose consciousness because when you lose consciousness, now you're flat and now the blood will go back to your head. So it's how we protect ourselves automatically, right? Um, but that response of the blood vessels and the automatic response to kind of boost your blood pressure back up doesn't happen as quickly. It doesn't happen as quickly as we age and, and, and the Parkinson's affects it too. So that's one of the things that we talk about as far as making sure if you really need that blood pressure medication. Are you monitoring your blood pressure at home? And that's why I take your blood pressure, in case anyone's wondering that, that sees me sitting and standing, that's why I do it. And when I ask you to monitor your blood pressure at home, I'm always going to ask you to do it sitting and standing because there's a, that's the drop. And a lot of times patients are concerned about higher blood pressures. So, you know, 120 over 30, 120 over, I mean, sorry, 120 over 60 is no longer the normal. Like we always wanted that as a goal. We don't expect that as a goal. It should be higher now. Um, and so now that we know that, just like we restricted salt and now they're telling us it's okay not to restrict salt so much. That's not for everybody, <laughs> but for the majority. Um, so things change, but um, a high blood pressure or an occasional high blood pressure is not as worrisome from a stroke perspective as that drop in pressure. So if you're going from 130 to 109, you're at a bigger risk for a stroke or a vascular event than you would ever be if your blood pressure stayed at 150. Right, so it's that drop that we try to avoid. So if we get your blood pressure better controlled and we leave you a little higher than is normal, that's okay because when you stand, you're going to drop, but at least that drop won't be as significant. And that's, that's where the danger comes in. Um, so some of the things you can do yourself is um, making sure you stay well hydrated. It feels like a favorite. I'm bad about that too, so. <laughs> but making sure you stay well hydrated um, increasing salt intake and that just pulls the water in and helps um, compression socks so it doesn't have to be the full stockings and now that it's winter it'll be a little bit less painful to do <laughs> but this compression socks gives you a little bit of that support to squeeze those vessels to push the blood back up um, and elevating the head of your bed about 30 degrees so it's not a lot just 30 degrees and it goes from it acclimates your body from being flat all night to standing and that's where the the issue comes in a lot of time early mornings so if you're not completely flat all night then it's not that drastic of a change when you're getting up and standing up and starting the day um, the other thing I say I tell patients is don't just pop up and go and I know that's hard but if you laying down sit count to ten stand count to ten don't attempt to take that step if you're feeling woozy because you're gonna fall right so make sure that you give yourself time um, some of the other symptoms apart from just the lightheadedness that people can feel with with orthostatic hypotension or when their blood pressure is just running low is fatigue headaches and you get this what we call coat hanger um, pain so it's the shoulder shoulder aches just kind of in the same pattern as a coat hanger um, you can get pain with that and you can get cognitive slowing you're not responding the, the blood flow isn't there, so the brain's not working like it should. Um, and in case we, you know, we never really explain, so orthostatic hypotension, it, what we diagnose it as is if your top number drops more than 20 or your bottom number drops more than 10 when you go from sitting to standing. So that's what we're looking for. Um, and you know, of course, what's the, what's the danger? With the passing out, apart from vascular events, it's the falls. The falls and the fracture, or the head trauma, or, and that's what we want to avoid. And just the feeling bad. If your blood pressure is low, you don't feel good. Okay? So those are the kind of things we, we try to stay ahead of and make sure. A lot of times you'd be surprised how many times patients are on two or three blood pressure medications. And we just taper off and all of a sudden it's not an issue anymore. So it's one of those things to stay on just to stay on top of and be aware of. Um, 33 to 66% of patients have pain. So, you know, Parkinson's can have pain. What I typically say is if it responds to your medication, then it's Parkinson's. If it doesn't respond to the medication, then it's not Parkinson's. So you can have 
you know, numbness, tingling, burning type pain, which is neuropathy for most of us. So you can have diabetic neuropathy. Um, but if it responds to sentiment and it goes away every time you take your medication, then it's related to the Parkinson's. And you're just one of those unlucky few that has pain as a wearing off symptom. So it's one of those to keep in mind, does it respond to the medication or does it not? Um, now, some who have chronic back issues or other issues, when you get stiff, you wear off and, and your, the rigidity comes back, the symptoms come back, then some of that back problem may come back or you know, and as you loosen again, that goes away. Um, and that's, that's related more to stiffness, shoulder pain, those kind of things. But what I refer to as pain, pain being more that um, neuropathic type pain that you get. And some people, you know, it might not be your leg, it may be your hip, it may be your shoulder, but it's that numbness, tingling, burning type pain that goes away. So what you can do um, for that is making sure you're not wearing off again. Um, the other type of pain that we, I, I classify as under pain is cramping, right? So spasm, muscle spasm, and it is wearing off. Um, most of the time it's, it's the wearing off. Rarely is it too much medication. That's more so in young onset Parkinson's that they get uh, cramping with too much meds. Um, but the cramping, especially at night, early morning, it's wearing off. And those can be pretty severe and disabling. So it's one of those things that we shouldn't ignore. If it's happening, let us know. Um, but some of the things, stretching. And you guys who have cramps probably have found some of these things on your own already. But um, the stretching, warm baths, some people, ice helps. Um, putting your yes, leg cramp, putting your foot cramp flat, putting your foot flat on a cold surface. Um, acupuncture points for massage, so those trigger points. Um, those types of things help. Um, but a lot of it is staying on top of the dosing. And those that see me know that I harp on your time and your schedules and don't let you wear off and make sure you're taking medication on time. But this, these are the reasons why. So we can avoid a lot of these other, other symptoms. Um, and moving on to um, the cognitive stuff. So cognitive changes and dementia. So cognitive changes doesn't always mean dementia. But there are mild changes in Parkinson patients, and we can see that in about 70% of patients. Um, that doesn't mean that everyone who has Parkinson's will go on to develop dementia. Um, but initially, once a diagnosis is made and you've had, you know, by the time we make a diagnosis, oftentimes it's about, so, you know, on average, maybe three to five years into a diagnosis, typically, before you start to see some symptoms. So what you start to see early on is things that we can pick up on a neuropsychological evaluation, so some very specific testing. And what you're seeing is very characteristic, the flexibility, executive function. So you're, you know, multitasking becomes a problem. So the speed of processing doesn't mean that you may even notice it or that anyone else would notice it, but it's there. And, and it's just focus, attention, um, and overstimuli, and it's, it's your brain's ability to do the, more than one thing at a time. And you, know, you are, you're trying to, to focus on the walking, the talking, the swallowing, all these things that we take for granted, and it does affect the, the mentation and the processing and all that. And that's something we would pick, like I said, we pick up on, on a testing, and you know, would it affect you on a day-to-day -day living, or like, probably not, you probably don't notice it, but it would be there. Um, when do we talk about dementia? So there is Parkinson's related dementia. Um, and that usually occurs later, in the later stages of Parkinson's and usually in, in older patients as well. Um, when they develop them, it's, it's not the typical um, issues that you would see with a lot of other dementias. It's a little different, but there is a lot more of what we call bradyphrenia, which is slow thought processes. Um, the memory not encoding that new memory and not being able to retrieve it as much. Um, and there's also a lot of problems with visual spatial. So being able to reach for things, making things fit, the visual spatial um, and perception issues. Um, and then the you know, issues with planning. And when we talk about poor planning, it's not planning the day, it's planning your movements, right? So what we, like we said, what we take for granted, figuring out how to turn around and sit down in a chair. So motor planning becomes affected. Um, 
And then a lot of times that can be accompanied by hallucinations. Um, typically in Parkinson's, about 40% of patients have hallucinations. It could have, some of it is medication. Um, if that's the case and we deal with it, we come off of some medications. Sometimes it happens regardless of medication. Um, a lot of times it, is, um, it can happen at night or as the evening wears on. Um, it's not to be confused with um, what we call visual illusions. So a lot of times what you see, you'll see like I see the trash can and for me, if I look at it real quick, it, it, it looks like a person. But if I look again, I realize it's not. I know it's not, it's just an illusion. It's just your brain trying to make sense at, out of an image that it saw quickly. So those are visual illusions, but not hallucinations. So hallucinations are seeing something that's not real, that's there, uh, you know, a person, an object. Um, but a lot of times it can be smells and it can be noises too. With Parkinson's, it's mainly the most common is visual, so seeing things that aren't there. But you can have, especially in low light settings or when you're by yourself and you hear something and it just kind of ruminates and it becomes a sound or a voice. Or, so let us know when that happens because there is things that we can do and there are medications and there's a lot of uh, there's new medication that works well so there's there's a lot of options out there to address and try to figure out but we need to figure out what's going on first but not to be afraid to talk about that and let us know it's happening oftentimes I realize is that no one's telling me that it's happening until I ask but you shouldn't be living with that um, if there's ever an acute change where everything was fine and all of a sudden there's hallucinations and confusion and you know and this is a, a, a drastic change from how it was maybe two days ago there's always something else going on so that's not you know it's not suddenly you're not tolerating the medication it's usually that there is a infection or something new was started something that's thrown you off usually it's a urinary tract infection so that's why I always wonder why I check that's why I check and that's usually what's going on so that's something to kind of keep an eye on. And it, and it goes back to the issues with the urination. So it's all connected. And then one of the other things that, that happens a lot with um, mood is apathy. So apart from depression, and this, this is a hard one um, because it's not hard for the patient as much as it is for family members or for the loved ones around. It's a, um, basically a lack of motivation. They just don't care and they're not depressed, they're not sad about it, um, there's not an emotion in it, they just really just don't care. And they don't want to go out and do things, they don't want to participate, and they're not sad about it. <laughs> and so a lot of times it's hard, more so for the family members, because they feel like they need to do something, they need to motivate them, what can I do? And it's hard for them just to know that their loved one is sitting there and not participating. And that's hard to treat. And it really, you know, we can try antidepressants, but that's one of those things unique with Parkinson's. It doesn't really respond to medication. And a lot of times it's just educating family and, and loved ones that the person isn't upset and they're not suffering. They just don't want to participate and there's not an, a reason for that. Um, and it's not laziness. <laughs> they're not lazy. They just don't have that energy and don't feel it. Um, so depression. Depression is the other big one that I think we don't talk about and I think that's because there is that stigma with mental health issues um, anyway um, that we should do better with in this country that we don't but 20 to 50 percent of patients with Parkinson's have depression it presents a little differently in, in a lot of patients with Parkinson's that it presents more as an anxiety um, and not so much as the sadness and the crying and the tearfulness um, that doesn't mean it can't, but a lot of times it presents as anxiety. Um, and it's important to, to monitor that in relation to dosing times too, because you can get anxiety and um, you know, a sense of, of depression or, or doom or as a medication wears off. And so it's, if that's, diff that's different than a, a depression. So we have to kind of tease that out. But if it's depression or anxiety that's kind of there all the time, then it should be addressed because that's not a way to live and it is impacting you and it impacts the disease process and how you respond to medication and it's chemical because once your dopamine levels drop your serotonin levels get out of whack your norepinephrine everything gets out of whack 
because there should have a balance, and we've disrupted that balance now. And so it responds quite well to antidepressants. And there's multiple to try, depending on what the symptom is and how you're responding. And, you know, or if you've been on an antidepressant for years and it hasn't changed and you're depressed, well, it's not going to change unless we change something. So you know, if it's the same dose, same medication, and it hasn't helped and it's been three years, it's probably time to try something different. Um, but let, you know, talk about it, let us know, because there's no point in controlling your tremor and improving your walk if you're depressed and not participating in life. Right? So it's one of those things that don't be afraid to bring it up and talk about it. Um, let's see. So some of the more motor, or sorry, sleep disorder issues. So 30% of patients have restless leg syndrome. Now, what is restless leg? Because I get a lot, I think, confusion on what it is and or told I have restless leg and it's really neuropathy or, or it's jerking, my clients, just a quick jerk here and there. So restless leg by definition, um, and you have to have these, so it's when um, you have a unpleasant, uncomfortable sensation in your legs and it usually comes on when you're resting or it worsens as you rest or the longer you're sitting and immobile that it gets worse, but it's a need to move your legs. But that, that unpleasant sensation that's hard to describe won't go away and it will continue to worsen until you move. And so you have, you have that need to move your legs. It happens a lot at night and when you're going to sleep or in the evenings when you're sitting down to watch TV, um, long car rides. It doesn't always have to affect your legs. You can have restless legs in your trunk and your arms. Believe me, when I was pregnant, I had it in my arms. <laughs> then it's, it is annoying. Um, the reason it happens a lot of times is low iron which is what was happening a lot of times in pregnancy, it happens with low iron. So there's one of those things, if it's a new issue for you, probably check iron studies if it's not responding to medication. Um, iron studies, because if your iron's low, you, you can throw all kinds of medications, not gonna fix it until you fix your iron level. Um, so if that's, the issue with it being at night is you're not sleeping well. If it's constantly moving and having to move, and then you're not resting, right? So, but a lot of times it responds. And the medication that we use for restless legs, so if you didn't have Parkinson's, we would use an, a dopamine agonist anyway. So a lot of times it's the same meds that you're already on, we just have to adjust dose. Now, if you have restless legs, what you might notice is in you, it's well controlled, that on days where you're more active or you've, or you've exceeded what's your normal activity, you might have a little bit of that restless leg that night. Or, and that, that happens and that can happen to all of us. Um, but I think one of the take, take home points is the iron levels and, and make sure that we're adjusting doses and controlling it if it's bothering you. The other one is REM behavior disorder. It's a, a sleep disorder. About 50% of Parkinson's patients have it. This is another one that precedes, often precedes the diagnosis of Parkinson's sometimes by a decade or more. Um, and we also look at it as a risk factor for Parkinson's in young patients who present just with REM behavior. So REM state of sleep is your dream state of sleep. And that's when, um, it's when you're dreaming. So it's our restorative sleep. When you're in a REM state of sleep, normally your body's paralyzed. What happens with REM behavior disorder is the disconnect doesn't happen. So typically how we're paralyzed now all of a sudden you are having very realistic dreams, very vivid dreams. Some of you may remember them and some of you may not, but a lot of times you do remember the very realistic dreams. And your body's not paralyzed, so you're acting out what you're dreaming. The reason naturally our body is paralyzed is so that we won't do that. So now you're asleep, you're dreaming, and you're acting out these dreams, and then if you kind of wake up a little bit, you can't tell what's real and what isn't real. And so a lot of times I get complaints that they're hallucinations. They're not necessarily, they're not hallucinations. They're just because you're not fully awake. Your body's awake, your brain's not. It's a good way to look at it. Um, and so you're seeing things, you're responding to things that aren't there. The danger with that is that you can get hurt. So patients that fall out of bed, can hit their heads, run into walls, punch things. And it can get very, very active. <laughs> um, and then the other issue is that you're not getting good quality of sleep. So if you're not getting into that dream state, which is your restorative sleep, 
then your body's not resting. The next day, all your symptoms will be more pronounced. You do that long term, and your cognition is going to get affected because you're not sleeping, you're sleep deprived essentially. So you're falling asleep at the drop of a hat, and your memory is impacted, and you're not functioning, and then all of a sudden, somebody, a doctor, someone wants to say you have dementia. Right? So always make sure that your sleep is good. And you know, it might not be, I ask patients, I usually look to their spouse. Do they talk in their sleep? Do they mumble? Do they, because you may not be aware that you're doing it, but you're waking up tired. That's a good clue. Um, if we've tried, and there are medications we can try, and you can try over the counter melatonin. Um, clonazepam is usually the, the choice, the drug of choice to treat REM behavior disorder by sleep specialists anyway. Um, but you can try a melatonin over the counter first. If it doesn't respond, then I usually say a sleep study because there could be other things going on. But you should look at REM behavior disorder just like as seriously as people look at a deal now with obstructive sleep apnea, right? Because it does impact your health and your sleep. Um, and the other end of it is getting hurt during the night or, or hurting the person next to you. <laughs> um, so those are kind of the main non-motor symptoms that we that I kind of ask a lot about and if you're wondering sometimes I don't ask directly about them but I'm, it's why I ask a lot of the questions that I ask about because I kind of get around to that and see how everybody's doing um, or if you're bothered by them ask ask about it talk about it because it can be controlled it can be dealt with um, and I think that that's you know that's part of treating the whole person right so I can't just focus on tremor and gait if you're not sleeping so it's all connected and it's all important. Um, I think we have time for some questions, but I think let me go over just a few things um, because you probably have all heard about it and or heard these names and want to know. There, there are new medications out. Some are not, not so new, but I, in case you're just hearing about them. Um, and they tie back to what we've talked about. A lot of these treat non-motor symptoms. So, um, one of the, the medications <clears throat> that are out there now to treat just the Parkinson's is water, is um, Ritari. So Ritari is Cinnamet, but it's a combination. It's a combination of the immediate release and the extended release of Cinnamet. And it's just able to give, it was initially intended to give more time, more on time, and decrease the dyskinesias. Um, so Usually, it, you know, if you're well controlled on your dose and doing well, you don't bother with it. But, um, you know, if you're getting down to three hours or less and having to dose more frequently, Ritari may be a good option to help extend that. Here soon, there will be a medication that works like Ritari that they feel may be, that may work better than Ritari. Um, so we'll see how that, but that's not out yet. Um, Ritari is, and so it does take some tweaking. And you know, some people it works great first time, the adjustment in dose, they're capsules and they're larger, but they can be opened up. So they're, in that sense, they, they can be easier to take. Um, but sometimes it does take tweaking. I usually say give me two, three weeks before you give up on it. Eventually you can find the right dose, but it's, it, you know, they, they used to, they have a, a little guide that tells you if you're on this much immediate release sentiment, it's this much Ritari. It didn't work that way. <laughs> so, so it does require some tweaking for most people. Um, the other medication that I've had a lot of success with is Nuplazid. So that's for um, hallucinations um, and it works very well. The reason I like it is, and, and we waited a long time for this medication to come out um, because it does not affect you know, a lot of times you guys know that we say avoid a lot of the antipsychotic medications because they can make Parkinson's worse. And, but this doesn't affect the dopamine receptors. So it allows me to control the hallucinations and, and all these things without having to adjust the dopamine or the cinnamon. So we can still treat it without making it worse. So that, and I've had a lot of success with that medication. So it's a good one. Um, Northera is one for the orthostatic hypotension. So that's for drops in, in the blood pressure. So there are medications out there that have been out for a long time that work well too. But 
this one is specifically, and this medication has actually been out for a very long time, just not available in the U.S. Um, but this one is specifically for, for patients who have orthostatic hypotension and have Parkinson's. And so a lot of times I can use it in conjunction with one of the other medications to raise blood pressure or just on its own. Um, and, but that tends to help a lot. I, I have not, I don't understand, there's not a lot of cardiologists that are using it. I'm not sure why. It's probably because it's indicated in Parkinson's in orthostatic, so they're not using it as often. Um, but I do use it, and it works well. Um, Safenamide is a new um, COMPT inhibitor. A COMPT inhibitor is basically falls under the same category as azelect and selegiline. And so it, is a, it inhibits the enzyme that chews up the dopamine so it lasts longer in your system. That's what um, azelect essentially does. And then the other things that they're looking at, they're a, a new dopamine agonist, which falls under the same category as Requip and um, Mirapex same type of thing. Um, and then there is a new, um, I don't think it's out just yet, but amantadine, which helps with dyskinesias. Um, a lot of patients are started on this early on because um, it has some mild effect to control of Parkinson's symptoms, but I use it mainly to control dyskinesias. Um, it's usually dosed twice a day, maybe three times a day, not more than that because I think side effects outweigh the benefits at that point. But um, there is a new one coming out that's extended release, so once a day, which I think would be nice and hopefully that works well. And then um, as far as not necessarily new, but it's been there, again, is um, the Duopa was the intestinal gel. Um, there are some information on the table about that too that does require a tube, but it's a, it's a consistent dosing of, of, dopa, of the Cinemet and for motor fluctuations, and it's a good option. Um, and, it, and, you know, I, I think the drawback on that is that there's the tube. Um, but for the patients who have done it, uh, you know, they, they like it and they have a good response to it. So it all depends on who the appropriate patient is, just like with everything. And then with the DBS, um, the deep brain stimulation, what we're looking at now is just new targets in the brain. So different areas to target to control those symptoms. Same process, same procedure, just different targets in the brain for better control. And that's really it. So those are kind of the things that are on. Now there are other treatments, slowing progression, but that's a whole different talk. <laughs> and so um, I thought we'd kind of keep it at that. And then I wanted to keep some time for you guys to ask some questions. Thank you.